so thank you to Anhat and Satarth Nagrit Sangathan because I think it was important to have this meeting. I remember uh, that evening when I was looking on social media when the order came, there was a lot of confusion. Somebody was like, what is the point? What will we get? There was also a lot of uh, comment, which is very typical of social media and to which at least I uh, don't waste too much uh, of my time reacting to that. Why is it written in this language? Why is it not in firmer language? Uh, after having heard uh, Gladson, for instance, and you know what the thought that really crossed my mind was, I wish someone like Gladson was speaking in the Supreme Court. I sometimes feel that the world of courts has got so abstracted from reality that we have, uh, you know, we are no longer talking about people. And I'm not talking about emotions. I'm not talking about, but I am talking about uh, placing the human being at the center of any of our cases. And I think it is, <laughs> it is almost by design that in the Supreme Court, uh, people are not interfacing with the judiciary, unlike say in district court, sessions court, where you at least see the havoc that law is causing on people's lives. And having heard the kind of uh, mayhem that a law like sedition, UAP, et cetera, are causing, we can also see why this, this order, interim though it is, plays an important role both in providing relief to those who are either apprehending arrest or uh, who are unable to speak up or who are already behind bars. And therefore, while it is an interim order, I think it's an important order and a significant order. And I, it's, and I think we also need to understand that this um, campaign against the offense of sedition has been going on through civil society for very long. And it's not as though the court one day wakes up and decides to give us this largest. Voices on the ground, voices like Gladson, the kind of uh, research that Article 14 has done, academic, legal academic research done prior to that, challenges posed, a prior challenge by uh, Uday Kumar before the Supreme Court. There is a, and conversations like this across civil society. So we need to recognize that these orders come at the back of us raising our voice repeatedly. And therefore it is not about the Supreme Court is great or not. I'm not even sure why that is ever a conversation. The point is, what is the order? And these are issues that we as civil society speak about. And we, we must uh, you know, see that these are the, the consequences of our work especially when times are so difficult. I remember that evening a client came to me and I actually said to him in all uh, seriousness, who is a client who's active on uh, social media, I said, oh, please go ahead and write whatever you feel like. Otherwise, I'm constantly in panic mode when my clients are posting things, but I'm like, oh no, one more case on our head. I said, but of course we have 153A, so just be careful, don't, how you articulate what you want to say. It's very interesting that in this case, but before I go there, just very quickly, uh, because uh, as uh, Anjali mentioned, I am one of the counsels in this case, a whole batch of petitions have been filed. Um, Justice Lokur had said that, you know, there is this uh, in para 8E of the 11th May order, there is this reference to directives. And I thought I'll just share as to where the directives came from and what transpired in court on that day. So as we know, the, the hearing happened over a couple of days and there was this whole issue which Justice Lokur has already mentioned that since Kedarnath uh, judgment of 1962 was decided by a five judge bench, a three judge bench with the CGI cannot overrule was one view. Many of us do not share that view and I'll uh, explain the legal grounds about that. But that was one of the uh, uh, issues that was raised in the court. At that point, uh, the court made it clear, all right, while the issue of the reference, et cetera, is to be decided, why doesn't the state take some, st the state kept saying, you know, we can, we, uh, the court then said, why don't you do something if you're saying, uh, you know, that you can look into this. And it was in that context that the state, the self solicitor general actually said, we can uh, issue some directives. 
Of course, all of us urged the Supreme Court that it must be through a judicial order for a host of legal constitutional reasons. The, um, uh, so, uh, uh, the Solicitor General representing the Union of India cannot issue orders on what a state police can or cannot do, what the state judiciary can or cannot do. That would be a breach of the federal structure that our constitution provides us. And therefore, it was important that the Supreme Court must issue the orders. However, the court left it open if the union wants to issue any order. The union anyway, to my mind, was speaking in a forked tongue. There is an affidavit telling us that the prime minister is very cognizant of human rights. And there is a written submission on behalf of the Union of India, which is saying Kedarnath is very good law. So at the best of times, I find it hard to comprehend what the Union of India is saying in the courtroom. Uh, so I will not uh, waste energy on that presently. So that is what the directive was. It really doesn't matter anymore. I think the directives issued by the Supreme Court will hold. There are some uh, gaps there, uh, which have been already highlighted by uh, Justice Lokur, and perhaps in time, people will come forward to the Supreme Court and secure clarification on those points. I want to move very quickly on who are the petitioners. And I think it's very telling. Two things I found were telling in the list of petitioners that we have. One that I myself, for instance, have filed on behalf of two women editors. Patricia Mukhim, who is the editor of Shillong Times from Meghalaya, and Anuradha Basin, who is the editor of Kashmir Times from Jammu and Kashmir. And the reason why I worked with these two petitioners was because we believe that sedition uh, offense has a particularly, uh, uh, particularly impacts on freedom of press which is part of the larger freedom of speech, but is distinct in its own right. The press has always been held, including in judicial orders, to be the fourth pillar of democracy. We know the state of the press uh, um, in our country, and therefore the small, limited, independent press that we have, media that we have, both electronic print otherwise, is also getting increasingly reined in and punished by through the offense of sedition. Secondly, because sedition and Article 19 look at issues of uh, security of the state, etc. Um, these two women editors work in areas where the state can claim that there are some concerns about national security, both in Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir. But interestingly, when I looked at the list of uh, petitioners, the Editors Guild of India, Foundation of Media Professionals, Sashi Kumar, a senior journalist, um, Arun Shauri and Common Cause. Then you have uh, Patricia Mukim and Anuradha Basin, who I mentioned. So we do actually have many members and two journalists who were themselves facing sedition. Kishore Chandra, Wanga Khemcha and Kanhaya Lal Shukla from Manipur. So these were all members of uh, the press who actually have come forward. So clearly the press was feeling the impact of the sedition offense very grievously, both in discharging its professional duty and being able to inform and speak. The other petitioners are People's Union for Civil Liberties. PUCL has also issued a very important statement pursuant to the order of 11th May, highlighting both what the order does and what are the possibilities which Justice Lokur also drew our attention to about how other provisions, other penal laws, other draconian laws like UAPA, et cetera, can, will and do continue to be used um, in a malified manner by the state. Another very interesting petitioner uh, is Major General S.G. Vombatkare and his is the lead petition. And I think uh, 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 Mr. Vombatkare is actually a very important uh, petitioner for the court also to reckon with. He was also the petitioner who challenged uh, the Aadhaar Act, and he has systematically fought and come before the court for freedom. Here is an 80-year-old um, retired major general who has uh, served in the armed forces and has actually uh, fought the 1965 war against Pakistan, etc. And uh, you know he's actually been 
in combat himself. So, he, and he said in, a, in the interview uh, after the order, he said that, why do we fight on the borders of the country? Why do we, why am I as a soldier willing to sacrifice my life so that people in the country can enjoy freedoms and the independence? And that is what motivates me as a soldier to be ready to sacrifice my life. I thought it was a remarkable uh, uh, way of giving us an insight and a very different way rather than some uh, jingoistic rhetoric that is usually given. So here we have Mr. Major General Wombatkare as the lead petitioner. You also have Dr. Sanjay Jain, who was an assistant professor from ILS uh, Pune, who's also one of, and Mahua Moitra, a member of parliament from TMC and well-known, uh, uh, you know, somebody whose uh, speeches we are all familiar with. So these, this is the cast of characters that is before. And I think what is telling, which strikes me, particularly after listening to Gladson, there are two things. One, of course, that there are a large number of members of the press. The second, that individuals have found it very difficult to come forward. People who are directly impacted, and my guess would be from, you know, one's own uh, experience of work is twofold. One, once you have been embroiled in these cases, you really don't have uh, the resources or the stamina to continue entangling yourself in long drawn legal processes. So what comes before the court is then representative in character. And very often the Union of India is like, who's before you? Who are these people? Who are these PIL petitioners? Who are these busybodies? And people are dismissed like that, which I, I find uh, extremely objectionable. It is really these people who are able to come forward in a representative capacity because those who you have targeted, you have actually been able to target them so severely that they no longer have the stamina. And I, I, they definitely have the, the uh, uh, capacity but the capacity to come forward and embroil while you are actually dealing with your own cases and trying to see what to do with them. So there is a reason why the individuals, whether in Jharkhand or in Tamil Nadu, find it hard. And I think that's what I mean when I say sometimes perhaps the Supreme Court is so removed from reality that it's, it doesn't know what, the, what their lived experience of ordinary, particularly marginalized groups in this country has become. And that, that is what these representative groups try to take to the court. Of course, we know that in a court of law, it is the grounds on which, the legal grounds on which, a child, and I'm going to take five minutes just to uh, 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 talk about them. So what, we know it's a colonial provision. It came actually in 1870. It was in Macaulay's draft for some reason, it didn't appear in the 1860 law. And then James Stephen introduced it in 1870. So when India becomes independent and the constitution comes into being, it is a watershed moment recognized by the constitution. And thereafter, every provision, every offense, every law must meet the test of constitutionality. Otherwise, it must be struck down. That is the principle. And fundamental rights chapter comes in only for one purpose, to, to rein in the power of the state to center stage persons' uh, uh, liberties and freedoms of citizens, and to ensure that the state cannot have excessive or arbitrary power and must be accountable to all citizens. And, that is, and, and for that, the power of judicial review of the constitutionality of a provision is given to the Supreme Court or to the High Court, both constitutional courts. The Kedarnath judgment was decided at a time when, and we know that the, the Constitution of India is a dynamic constitution through interpretation. It has been transforming itself as our understandings grow and as we as a republic grow. When Kedarnath Singh was decided, the, the reigning understanding of the court was that you have to show whether an offense or any provision of law is violating any singular, every singular uh, article 
fundamental right guaranteed in chapter three. That understanding changed in the 70s with what is called the R.C. Cooper judgment of 11 judges and said that you have to take 19, 14, 21 articles all together and you have to see whether the challenge that is given, what is its impact? What is it, its, its effect on lives of people and not just what the objective was? Secondly, these are not in silos. These freedoms move together and they don't exist in watershed compartments. And that new understanding are when we are saying before the Supreme Court that you don't need to go to a larger bench. It is because what was good law at the time of Kedarnath is over. 11 judges overruled it in 1971. In Puttu the Aadhaar case in, uh, 20, in 2017, again it was reiterated. So Kedarnath was passed at a different time. That is no longer good law. And therefore, these matters need to be heard even by a three-judge bench. Anyway, that's a technical point. They can send it to a seven-judge bench. We are ready to argue before each any bench. But the, the way in which the constitutionality of Kedarnath was, was looked at, that is no longer good law. Secondly, and this is very interesting, at least I found it interesting. When Kedarnath was made, uh, uh, when sedition was made an offense, in 1973, it was a non-cognizable offense. It becomes a cognizable offense only when the Criminal Procedure Court comes in, uh, uh, in 1973 through an amendment. A non-cognizable offense means that if you want to arrest somebody, you will have to go and get a warrant from a magistrate. So even when it was a colonial offense, the colonial masters said there should be magisterial oversight before arrest. And in 1973, it becomes a cognizable offense. Of course, it was always non-bailable. It becomes a cognizable offense. And then the police just gets up and whatever tweet, message, whatever they don't like, whatever their political masters don't like, and lo and behold, arrests are being made because you know police really has nothing better to do in this country. And it's interesting that this shift to, to cognizable, this was not there in 1962. This happens in 1973. So the offense that was tested in Kedarnath is not the same offense. It's a different offense. The third, third point, which I want us to just think about, look at the sentence that the sedition offense carries. There is no provision in the entire Indian Penal Code which has this kind of sentence. You can be sentenced for life imprisonment with fine. And we know that in India, life means life, not 14 years, what Hindi cinema has been telling us. Life imprisonment with fine or three years or three years with fine or only fine. So I can be sentenced only with fine or I can be sentenced with life imprisonment. Has anybody ever seen this range of sentencing in any offense in the Indian Penal Code? I have not seen it. And I checked it very thoroughly for this uh, uh, matter. And there is no sentencing guideline. It doesn't say that if you are going to say these kind of things, because after all, it's all about words and, and visual representation, then it will be, uh, you'll get a higher sentence. It doesn't say anything like that. It just gives this, so it gives unbridled judicial discretion that you can go ahead and um, give any sentence depending on, without any guidance to the judiciary, either from the legislature or sentencing guidelines. The other aspects are a little, uh, uh, one other aspect and the rest are too legal and technical, I won't go into it. Look at the offense, the way it is drafted. So the Cardinal principle of criminal law is that the offense must be drafted with precision because you cannot have an offense that has some dila dila definition and because then nobody will know whether an offense has been committed or not and why I should know what the offense is, I should be informed by law 
so that I know what I'm not supposed to do. Now, the words used are so overbroad. They are so vague. They are completely, it's impossible to have a precision with which to read them. And that is what gives the state and its agents complete arbitrary, uh, 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 you know, playground for malafide and vindictive arrests. For instance, the word like disaffection. And I would disagree with Justice Lokur. I think there is a huge difference between government established by law and state, and we should not concede that distinction. I can have disaffection to government established by law. I am a citizen of this country. I am casting a vote. I may not have voted for this government. I can openly stand and say I have disaffection to the present government. It is not an offense. It cannot be an offense in uh, a democracy. Otherwise, how can you be a democracy? So words like disaffection, which Kedarnath tried to narrow down and say only if there is an intention or tendency to incite violence. And we know what has come of that. Gladson has told us, uh, 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 Uday Kumar will tell us more, and we all have different experiences of different states. What the Supreme Court writes and what the policeman and the politician does on the ground, because nobody is held accountable, there is mayhem going on in the name of the authority that they have. And therefore, I will stop there to say that this provision needs to go because it is legally unsustainable. And while welcoming the order of the Supreme Court with the gaps that it may have, I still think it's a significant and important order. Our campaign to repeal sedition and all other draconian provisions must continue. And I hope the Supreme Court hears the matter at the earliest. Thank you.